Welcome to the, to the importing data uh, into Neo4j talk. Uh, so, so I'm Mark. Um, I'm Michael. Uh, we're gonna, what we're going to be looking at in the next half an hour is uh, how much of uh, Stack Overflow and can indeed we get Stack Overflow uh, into Neo4j. Uh, so here's, here's some, just some quick statistics of what, what is on uh, Stack Overflow. So, uh, Who of you has never been on Stack Overflow before ever? OK, no one. OK, <laughs> perfect. How many of you has had a Neo4j question on Stack Overflow that Michael hasn't answered within 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, got an unhappy customer. That's his SLA. Uh, OK, so we, so we, we obviously are on Stack Overflow quite a lot. A lot of people ask uh, Neo4j questions on there. It's quite, and there's, a, yeah. there's now a big, quite a big community. You have uh, now people more than 10,000 questions on Neo4j on Stack Overflow, which is yeah. pretty impressive. So, so, yeah, so this, 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 it's a good, pla good place for, for if you have a question about anything that you see today, that's quite a good place to, to go if you, if you want to get an answer. Um, and so we thought it would be quite interesting to have a look. Can we actually put that data into Neo4j, and is there anything interesting we can find out from doing it? Uh, so we're going to focus on, in here on the, uh, on the actual getting the data into Neo4j, uh, but we'll link you to a blog post at the end where you can go and actually replicate this work, and, and there's a whole load of queries on that blog post that you can uh, then go and try out and see uh, you can actually go and check whether Michael actually does reply to things within 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, so Stack Overflow has an uh, API available, but this, of course, has API rate limits, and it gives you only so much, and takes a while to download the data. Uh, but what it also has, it's a, it's a data dump. So internet.org, so the Internet Archives host the data dump, which is just a gigantic XML uh, storage. So it's just a glorious dump of of SQL Server, actually, right? So the XML is not really XML, it's just a dump of SQL Server. It's CSV pretending to be XML. And it's about 66 gigs or so uh, when, we, when we downloaded yeah. it. Uh, and um, so we wanted to see how long it actually takes to get this into Neo. So this is the, this is the structure uh, of the talk. <laughs> Magic a bit of magic here. import dust, that's what you need. <laughs> uh, so we've got these two APIs. We've got kind of, I mean, they're kind of two completely different, different ways of, uh, different types of data. There's one yeah. which is like an API, which is, is kind of updated all the time. If you query it again, you'll get the questions that have just happened uh, on Stack Overflow. And then we've got, as Michael just described, we've got the dump, which is kind of like, I don't know, is it once, once a month? Yeah, once, once a month or once, once a, a any, every time, kind of once, once a while. Once a, yeah, once a month or once a quarter, somebody will go, OK, cool, right, you deserve another, another Stack Overflow dump community. Here you go. Um, but so, the, so, so we've got two different approaches to getting these two different types of data into NeoJ. Uh, so we're going to start with this one. Um, so this is what it looks like. So we've we, we got an API. Uh, it's, it probably looks really similar to any uh, uh, web API you've seen before. So if you were at the training uh, yesterday, uh, th there was, we were doing a recommendations training, and there was a Meetup API, which looks basically the same, just with d different data. Yeah. Uh, and so you just have, you, know, you just have lots of properties, uh, and it describes yeah. different things. Exactly, about exactly the, the stuff you know from the website, like question ID, which is in the URL, the, the, the title, the text, the answers, the reputation, the votes, and all the stuff that you see on the website is also in the, in the, in the JSON API. Uh, and so uh, built in, so we're going we're to start, we're going to show you two ways to, to process this, uh, this JSON data. So, so the first one uh, is using a tool, which if you've used uh, Neo before, you're probably quite familiar with, uh, which is called uh, Load CSV. Uh, and so that's, that's a tool that allows us to take uh, CSV files, or lots of different CSV files, and run and basically iterate over them and create things in the graph. Um, but obviously, uh, we are currently over here. Uh, we're in JSON land, and so we need to get... Uh, to CSV, CSV format then, yeah. first before we can actually use the tool. Um, so this is the model that we're going to drive towards. Uh, so this is, the, this is the model we came up with. So remember, this is the JSON. And what we're going to do, we're going to create a graph uh, that has some users, some answers, some questions, uh, and then some tags. So those are just the way that people tag their questions to try and uh, get attention from, from the right person to answer them. So you could uh, go and tag something with Neo4j or, or Python or Python Neo or, or whatever, whatever your question was about. Yeah, uh, so so we're and it's really important to uh, model your data first because you actually in, in Neo4j you want to import into the model. So you don't want to take the raw data from somewhere and import it as it is because most of the other data sources have a certain purpose and a certain kind of use case. And the graph use case that you want to run might not be the same use case as the other data sources. So it makes a lot of sense to first think about what do I want to do with data, model the data that it can answer your questions. For instance, we left off like most of the body of the, of the questions because that's something that was not interesting to us. Or for instance, we also uh, left off comments in this case because that was not interesting to us because we wanted to look more on the structure. And then we import into this model. That's quite important because otherwise you get 
a messy graph model, and then you're not happy, and then I have to ask, answer questions, and you know. <laughs> and I'm happy to ask stack questions. overflow points. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is the Swiss Army knife for manipulating JSON. JQ is a pretty cool tool. It's implemented in C and C++, so it's also super fast. Um, it's like what XPath is for um, for XML, but much better. So it has a, a really rich language of reaching into JSON documents, converting them, doing a lot of, of stuff, and creating new da data types. So it can convert JSON to JSON. It can convert JSON to, for instance, CSV. And we, what we do is we reach into the JSON from the API, grab some of the elements even deeply, and then it's converted into, into CSV. And OK, so let's have a look at an example of how we're going to do this to get that graph that we just described. Uh, so we've got our, uh, we call it so.json, so that we, we downloaded like an array of the, of the uh, questions uh, into a file. Um, and then we're going to kind of iterate through them. Uh, and they, they sit under uh, an array called items. Uh, so hence, uh, we're in items. And then we just go through and go, uh, and we're going to grab the question ID, the title, uh, and so on. Each of these uh, is going to be kind of one column in our CSV file. So we get those, we put them as an array. Uh, then we're just doing a little bit of work to get the tags. So they give you the, uh, the tags. Uh, we want them to be, there's lots of tags for one question. So we, we kind of make them semicolon deseparated. That's, what the, that's the only complicated bit. That's this bit. Uh, and then we're running, uh, we're running it through, they call, I think it's, they call this a filter. So we're saying, convert that to CSV. So it just goes and puts a, a comma between every item. Uh, and if you've got spaces in there, it will quote it. If you've got commas in there, it will quote it as well. So. Uh, and we end up with this. Um, so you can kind of see the system. It's, it's quite a, a standard sort of CSV format. There's not really anything clever going on here. Uh, we've got a question ID. We've got a title. It describes all the different, the other things that we put in. And then we've got one row uh, for each, uh, effectively for each JSON document that we had in our original uh, API call. Yeah. That de depends a bit on your JQ query, what, how yeah. many rows you get. But in our case, it's one row per, per question. Yeah. OK, so then we'll do the same for the answers. This is pretty much the same as before. Uh, so we, we kind of go through, we JQ it into CSV. That's on CSV. Uh, right, OK, so now we've, got it, now we've got it into a format that load CSV is happy with. Uh, so there's your standard meme. Uh, it's time to do some importing. Um, I think you all know Cypher, so we, we, we'll, we'll skip this bit. And Otherwise, we'll, you learned it really quickly now. Yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah, if you learned Cypher from that, you should probably come and work with us. <laughs> that would be some seriously quick learning. Uh, OK, so this is, this is the, the load CSV uh, tool. So it's a, it's a command in Cypher. So if you go to your NeoPager browser, you will have it, have it there already. Um, and effectively, it allows us to iterate over a, over a CSV file. Uh, and we can provide it uh, a URI, or we can provide it a file path. So um, yeah, um, so you can put, if you yeah. find a CSV on the web, you could just directly load that without even uh, downloading it to your machine. So and um, what it does is, depending on if the width headers is provided or not, it will return each line of the CSV either as a, as a list of values or as a map, which it kind of maps the headers to the fields. And that's kind of just an input that you can use in Cypher to, to do stuff, right? So you can destructure it, you can create data, you can update data, you can remove data, you can also just match data with stuff that comes from the CSV. So you can also drive kind of computation from CSV if you wanted to. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do. And you can also filter and group the CSV and, and aggregate it if you want to on certain properties, um, um, some of which I usually use to uh, assert data quality. So what you can do is to run your CSV through Cypher so you see it the same way as Cypher sees it, uh, which means you know, broken CSV with uh, kind of lone quotes and, and, and zero binary zeros in there and, and stuff like that. You see it immediately because something breaks, right? And uh, so you make sure that your data quality is good, and then you can continue from there. Yeah, and so, with, so when we, so we, we so like, like, like Michael said, we get a map. In our case, we've got a header. So we're going to get a map of all the items. We're going to get a question, a name. The, we'll get the upvote count and whatever other things we put on there. And then for each row, uh, we, can, we apply some sort of uh, cipher operations to it. So there's pretty much three that we're going to look at. Uh, we can either be creating something. Uh, so for example, we could be creating a node, or we could be uh, creating a relationship. Um, so that will just create it. Like regardless, if you don't uh, do any of any constraints or, or anything like that, it will just go and create it every time. Um, if we don't want it to do that, and we're like, well, actually, if it's already there, I don't want you to go and create it again. Uh, we might want to use a merge. So merge is effectively that. So it's, if it's already there, I just return it. And if it's not, uh, then I'm going to create it. 
Um, so this is the, if you want to write idempotent load CSV scripts, this is the, this is the word you want to be with. Uh, and then sometimes we'll actually have some data in the database already, and we'll be wanting to add to the graph uh, with our load CSV query. And in those cases, we might want to actually have a match in there as well. So we might match something and then, uh, and then do some merging or creating afterwards. And as a general rule, create is faster than merge because it doesn't have to check, it just pumps into data. Uh, that can be really useful for initial imports, so when you kind of first feed your database with data, then create is much faster than, than merge, of course. And, um, but it means you have to handle duplicates like outside of, of Neo4j. So exactly. this, will, this will handle duplicates for you, uh, it, but this will be faster because there's no, there's, no, yeah. there's no duplicate check. And what you can do in load CSV actually is because uh, it returns a, a list of um, ma or a rows of maps, you can just add like a width filter that, for instance, aggregates or sorts out duplicates by doing a distinct on the input values. And then uh, you can make sure that either the number of rows it is reduced, uh, killing uh, all the duplicates, especially if you have data that comes from a join of multiple tables from a relation database, for instance. And then you ha also have to mu do much less work in general. Right? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff you can do before actually decipher operations to change the graph happen uh, to, uh, to make it faster and, and easier yeah. to work with. OK, so let's have a look. So you got your uh, CSV files from, uh, from Stack Overflow. And you're like, OK, cool, I'm going to create this graph. So you might start out with something like this. Uh, so you're like, you do a, right, so a load CSV from questions.csv, cool. Uh, I'm going to create a question. I'm going to put an ID on there, a title, upvote count, creation date, great. Then I'm going to create an owner. I'm going to hook the, connect the owner to the question. Then I'm going to iterate through the tags. This is kind of just going through that semi-colon uh, separated array we had. I'm going to create a tag. I'm going to connect the question to the tag. Uh, then you run it. And you're like, ah, this seems to be running for quite some time. <laughs> um, so the first thing is, uh, when you're like trying to work out, does this uh, like when you're playing with it with a data, data set for the first time, actually do do a smaller sample. You don't need to do all a million records or ten billion records or whatever it is you've got. Start with like you know, I was saying hundred. Maybe you could do a few more than hundred. Start with something small and see does it actually work? Can I if I go and query that? Is is it actually in the right? Is it, have I structured it correctly to allow me to write the queries that I want? Yeah. Uh, and don't try and do the whole thing uh, in one go. It's uh, tip number one. And you can also do like uh, total runtime estimation. So if, if the 100 elements take like 10 seconds, and if you run 1 million, then you just multiply it out. Yeah, and then so you, you can know. kind of work out in advance, pain is coming unless I, unless yeah. I, uh, unless I And also size queries. requirements. So if you look at your store files on disk after the f kind of small import, then you can also multiply it out. And then you have an yeah. estimate on how much m um, memory or disk space you need afterwards. So that's useful anyway to yeah. do small samples. And also it speeds up kind of the round trip times because if I always try it on like 100 million data sets, I always have to wait until it's done. And so I can have round trip times for an, for, of a second or so. And I can change something, run it again, change something, run it again. Yeah. And so it's much faster to, to iterate on that. OK, so right. That's number one. Right, so that's number one. So second thing is when you're using merge, so merge is kind of going and, going, uh, uh, and having a look. Of the properties that you put in, inside here, uh, it's going to go and have a look. Is there anything else already in my database that has that, in this case, has the ID? In our previous uh, case, we were looking, is there any question which has the ID and the title and the upvote count and the creation date? So you're kind of checking four different things, uh, when actually you know uh, that whether a question is, is unique or not based on this ID. So this is the, uh, effectively the Stack Overflow's primary key. They give, a, they give a question ID to everything. So we might as well use that. We don't need to go and compare every single property. Uh, and check whether it's the same. Uh, and we can do the same for the owner as well. So they've got a key on the owner. So the second, so the second tip is use the key. If they've got a key, uh, just use that inside your merge. Don't put every single thing in there. Uh, because what you probably want to do is, is, is just set these properties if, if they're not already set. You don't actually really want to use them to go and, 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 check and remove duplicates. Uh, and so we're just pulling this apart. And we're using a, 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 the onCreate uh, clause or, or command yeah. to, to help us exactly. out. So if you run the script again, uh, it would check, oh, yeah, the question's there. Oh, well, I'm not creating it, because you've already created it the previous time you ran, so I'm just going to not do anything. <coughs> exactly. OK. Yep. Um, but there's something needed for that. Yeah, so, 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 in order, right, so, so by default, that, that checking, well, are there any other questions, is going to be scanning the question, uh, question label. Uh, but what we might want, it, but we'll probably realize then, and at the beginning, it will be quick. Uh, it will probably be really fast, because it's only scanning a few. It's like the first time it's like really fast. It's like, oh, there's only 100 questions, then there's 200 questions, then there's 10,000 questions. You're like, why is it getting slower as I go on? Uh, and so at that point, you, might, you probably realize, ah, there must be a faster way to do this. Uh, and this is, this, this is the point where uh, constraints and uh, 
indexes can help us. So, uh, for, for example, so, so the difference is, so a constraint uh, will actually uh, ensure that that uniqueness. So for example, for the questions, we actually want to make sure uh, that you can't create in our database uh, another question with the same ID. So if you did that, that would be really bad, because now we've got uh, two, different, uh, two different ways of describing the same thing. Uh, and the same for the users. Uh, and okay. indexes are used to, to allow us to go and, and quickly search something, but they don't ensure that uniqueness. So a unique constraint kind of has ensure uniqueness and allow us to quickly look something up. Indexes just quickly look something up. Yeah. And uh, the constraint automatically also creates an index. Uh, so you, when you create a constraint, you also benefit from the index lookups. And indexes, in, especially in version 3, now support a lot of other operations as well. It's not only just equality lookup. Also, when you have string operations like starts with, contains, or ends with, it uses an index. And also range queries. So if you have like numeric fields or, or text fields and you compare with something is less than something else, then the index will be used. Something If you have a range, also the index will be used. Yeah. So it's much faster on all these queries that have these kinds of um, more complex uh, predicates as well. Uh, the next thing is uh, that you'll often find that just putting one merge in the statements instead of like building one massive uh, import query, uh, it's often quicker just to do to uh, to build like one merge per statement. So for example, we'll do one for the question, then we'll do one for the owner, uh, and then we'll do one to combine it uh, to combine them together. Uh, so often found like just just pulling out pulling the part of the query and do <coughs> do do the do the different parts separately uh, is often helpful. Yeah. Exactly. What you can also do in this, uh, at this stage, when you just create nodes, you can even parallelize it because all the node labels are independent of each other. So you can run the inputs in parallel. And if j as many cores as you have available, can uh, process it in parallel. So that will be much faster. And when you create a relationship, actually, Neo4j got also much smarter since version 2.3. Um, because there might be some nodes in your, um, in your database. In Stack Overflow, it's, for instance, a tag node that has a lot of relationships. And if you do merge on relationships, it has to check and to assert that uh, there's not already a relationship of this type and direction between the two nodes. So it has to iterate over the relationships between the nodes and checks if, if there's already something there. And in the new versions, it actually looks at the degrees of the nodes. So if this is a node with a lot of relationships, like a million or 10 million relationships, it takes a while to iterate over them. But on the other side, oftentimes you have just one relationship back, right? A question that has only uh, to, to a tag of a certain type, it only has one link at most, right? So from the other side, the check is much faster. So it chooses the, um, the node with the smaller degree to look from that side. And that's called merge into operation. So you see that in your query plan as well. And that makes stuff like that, or kind of if you have deep and wide categories to import, uh, much faster as well. So their cipher actually does the work for you. you can uh, this, is, this is Michael's favorite one. Uh, so this is the. This is the uh, don't do the same work over and over again uh, tip. Uh, so in this data set, it applies to the tags. Um, so in our questions, lots of people tag the, the, the kind of the same, the same thing. So you, uh, when you're creating the tags, you'll see it coming up loads and loads of times. Like, for example, if there's 10,000 Neo4j uh, entries, you'll see 10,000 uh, entries with Neo4j, the, the Neo4j tag. And so what we can actually do here is reduce the work in progress, or, or reduce the work that the load see that the merge actually has to do uh, by making use of the distinct when we're creating our tags. And so exactly. then, uh, yeah. instead of creating or going over uh, near for j 10,000 times, we just get it once, uh, and, then we, and then we create it. Exactly. So you save uh, 10,000 index lookup for one, more or less. Yeah. And with a more popular tag like JavaScript or, or, or Java, you save 10 million index lookups for one. Yeah. Right. So let's go. Uh, another, another, another thing that you can use is uh, load CSV has a periodic commit attached to it. Uh, and so that will allow you to, uh, to flush, effectively flush the, what's happened, the transaction state that's happened uh, every, by default, 1,000 rows. So it will take, for example, in this, ex in this example, uh, we'll take the first 1,000 questions, uh, then commit those, then go to the next 1,000, uh, and so on. Uh, so the reason you, you would do this uh, is because Neo4j keeps transaction state in memory. Uh, and if you had, for example, uh, let's say you have 10 million questions in this file, that's 10 million uh, 10 million Updates. records worth of, of yeah. transaction state, which will probably, yeah. dip, uh, maybe you've got the best laptop ever uh, yeah. and lots of RAM on it, so maybe yeah. you'd be okay. But for, 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 our, for our laptops, we'd probably exceed it. Yeah, if you want to be on the safe side, then something between 10,000 and 100,000 uh, updates per transaction makes sense. I mean, usually you can do like a million for, with four gigs of, of heap. Uh, but I, you, you wouldn't stress it because it also depends on the number of properties. And in general, I mean, it's good that Neo4j is a transactional database, so it protects updates from each other. It makes sure that stuff gets durable committed and stuff like that. 
and you just have to make sure that this kind of overlaid state of your, of your changes doesn't grow too big so that it impacts the other operations. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot. We'd even explained it. Yeah. We've done See. all the explanation already. So basically, uh, the only thing to keep in mind from here is that that periodic commit um, uh, applies only to load CSV. If you want to do a big graph refactoring of something that you've already imported, and you're like, oh, I really wish I had uh, the periodic commit there, then you've got to, you've got to do, uh, you've got to do, kind of handle your own batching, uh, or as we'll see in a minute, uh, Michael ha probably has, as Emil said uh, in the keynote, Michael probably has a procedure for it. Yeah, uh, that's a procedure for that, right? Um, a procedure for that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we've probably got to speed up a bit. <laughs> I think we're going to get, we've got to get half an hour's worth, like an hour's worth of talking in half an hour. Um, but uh, effectively, you can, you can script uh, these things. So we've kind of been showing individual queries. And it's OK. When you start, you're like, cool, I'll run that, I'll run that in the browser. And after a while, you're like, oh, it'd be cool if I had all these things so I can like, try it again or try a different relationship name there or update one of those properties. Uh, and so you might want to start collecting them into a, uh, into a, a script. And you can run that uh, through the Neo4j shell tool that comes uh, with the database. Um, Exactly yep, so like this that. is just sort of showing what does the syntax yeah. look like. So you can give it, give it a script, tell it where you want to create the database and it, and, or, or where your database yeah. is, uh, and it will uh, create that for you. So you have to watch out in Neo4j 3, the, the desktop installer, so the Windows Excel or the DMG doesn't come with the shell. But there's a yeah. tool written by my colleague William, for, which does it kind of uh, as a web version. So you have a web version where you can upload a file, and then it automatically runs that. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, come to the Graph Clinic and find us, and we show you where it is. Yeah. OK, so to quickly summarize what we've just, what we've just been talking about, so we've got load CSV. Um, you can use it as, to import stuff. You, as Mike described, you can also use it to inspect your data before you do anything and check what is actually there. Have we got bad data? Do we need to go and do some cleaning before we try to import it? Um, it's been in Neo4j it's about a couple of years now, isn't it? I think yeah. so it's been since 2.1. Um, and you Please. can take any URI. So you can take a file. You can take a HTTP URI. Uh, and we've seen probably up to about 10 million rows. If you start to get beyond that, there's probably, you'll probably want to use the second tool that we're going to introduce. Yeah. Um, so Emil's already not ruined my slide. So, so Neo4j 3.0 has got the procedures, uh, and they allow you to write uh, custom code. And <laughs> Michael's got some presents for you. Yeah. So. Um, when procedures came out and it f became possible to call it from Cypher, actually, uh, I, I realized that so many things that are, uh, we could add to the language and add from the ecosystem system things that people wanted to have all the time. And now it's just easily possible to add them and try them out. And if, if they mature, then we can move them into the product and into the language. And so we uh, built a few proce procedures. I think it's. Yeah, he's actually shaved his beard for today. So we get that picture. <laughs> yeah. That's how he normally looks like. <laughs> That's how I look when I'm sitting coding. <laughs> no. um, so we have one procedure, for instance. You saw the JQ uh, uh, thing that we did. But actually, you don't have to do it because, as you all know, Java, or many of you know, Java can properly handle J JSON pretty quickly. Um, with Jackson, and so we can just also just implement it in, in two lines of Java, more or less, to get a JSON URL from somewhere and turn it into a, a row of maps on a single map, and then the, the procedure actually returns that to yeah. Cypher, and then we can do whatever load CSV did as well. So which is pretty cool, and when we call it, so we can have a look. This is us having a look. Uh, this is the Stack Overflow API we used for the first bit. So we're kind of going, uh, we're just calling it directly. So we call, we just pass in the URI. Uh, so they don't need any key for, the, for, this, for this API. So you just go, you just call it. We're saying, get me the questions. Get, get me 100 uh, with the Neo4j tag. And uh, they come back, value is the default. And you just yield that. And then we, remember, we've got items. So we're going uh, so to use the unwind, unwind keyword to, to sort of get them out of the row. And then we're just going to return them. And then you can kind of see. I mean, we're just showing the question ID and the title. And you get those all the way through. Uh, and then if you wanted to then actually, instead of doing all that load CSV stuff, you could do it uh, with load JSON instead. Um, and you can kind of see we go through, uh, we got the row, and now we're in exactly the same place. So instead of having to use the CSV files, uh, we can just uh, process the JSON uh, directly. Yeah. And as you see, uh, Cypher is really good at deconstructing actually nested structures. So you can have a map of lists of maps, of arrays of maps, of lists. And Cypher is actually pretty good at reaching into these things as well. And, um, so you and, can then, and then you can still apply all the, t all the things that we've talked about the whole way through. They're not specific to, most of them are not no, specific to load CSV. You can, uh, you can still use them if you were doing the load JSON stuff. Exactly. Um, if you if you if, uh, if you want to see more uh, procedures, our colleague uh, Will that, that, my, uh, that Michael referenced before is going to be talking in here and sort of having a look at lots of different data sources and how do you get data from those into the <laughs> So that's at uh, uh, four thirty. So he's going to uh, 
Yep, so if, you, if yep. you're interested in that, there's some stuff there. Uh, but now we're going to have a look at how would we uh, bulk, uh, to, to sort of wrap really up, quickly. Uh, bulk yeah. load uh, the initial data set. Um, so let's so what we did is we took the initial data set, uh, which is, as I said, lots of XML files, which are pretty gigantic. And I just wrote some small Java code to turn them into CSV files, kind of strip the XML out of the CSV again. And um, then we had these pretty big uh, XML, uh, CSV files, which made up like 30 gigs or something like that. So this and is the script. And Neo4j, since version 2.2, I think, comes with, or 2.3, no, 2.2 comes with a uh, bulk import tool. And the bulk import tool uh, uses all your CPUs, all your disk I.O. performance that you can kind of provide to take the uh, CSV files that you have, plus a um, configuration that we'll talk about in a second, and ingest it as fast as your machine can handle. Right? So if you have a big box with many CPUs, uh, ultra fast disk, it can, it can really saturate both CPUs and disk while importing the data. So it's really uh, super helpful for that. Yeah, so we, that script we've just run is basically this. So I just quickly explain what is, what is it we've done. Uh, so in your bin directory, when you download Neo4j 3.0, uh, you get a, a, a tool called Neo4j import. I mean, it's been there, it's been there a while. Uh, it's still there. Uh, and what we're doing, we're basically building an offline database. So we're, as Michael said, we're skipping all the, the transactional layer, and we're just building uh, the actual store files of the database. Uh, and you can kind of see here, what are we actually, what, what uh, CSV files are we processing? Um, so the nice thing about this uh, is it's really, really fast. Uh, but you've got to do, you kind of got to do a bit of pre-work yourself. So you've got to get the data into the format uh, to pass it to it. So for example, uh, if we look at one of them, so we're going to create some posts. So we give it a header, so you can separate the header files. So often when you get Hadoop dumps, uh, you've just got all of the, the, all the data in part files, so like spread out in lots of different part files. And you're like, oh, I don't want to go and have to add a header into all of those. Uh, so with the tool, you don't have to. You can just say, well, the header is in a different file. Uh, and then this is where my uh, gzips uh, content is. Uh, and so we're creating the nodes there. And we've got the relationships in a separate file. So that's, that's one of the bits of work you've got to do. Uh, and then we're just saying, hey, go and create me this, uh, this graph in this folder here. Uh, and we, uh, so we're running this uh, for the whole of the Stack Overflow data set. All the metadata of Stack Overflow uh, is going to be in, in Neo4j, is going to be in a Neo4j database once the script is run. This is what the files look like. This is the format you need to give it. So you need to specify, uh, effectively, like, it's almost, it's like a mapping. Called. Yeah, so effectively, you need to define a mapping, so, and you can define your properties in there. And these keys, uh, the, 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 the key that you use in here for the post ID will be used uh, in the relationship one. So the, you have a start ID, which will be, for example, a post, uh, and the, or, or a user, I suppose, uh, and then a post, which would, be, would, which would go there. So you'd have a post and a user. Um, yeah, you can also do um, things like uh, type conversion. So you can say, this is a Boolean, this is an int, this is an int array, and stuff like that. So it will automatically split stuff. Yeah, and and so, so like Michael said, he's taken uh, an XML file. Which is actually just JSON, uh, just CSV wrapped in XML, which is kind of stupid. But It's actually originally, I think it's originally a SQL Server, isn't it? It's SQL Server. So it's actually so SQL it's Server into CSV into XML. And now we've taken it back to <laughs> some sort of variant of CSV. Uh, so there is a magical Java program here. Uh, that's a bit of the ma Michael's magic import dust. Uh, I think you've got that. I think we've got that on, Saka, uh, yeah, on it's, GitHub it's, somewhere. It's, so it's you can on grab the blog, that. Po in the blog post. Uh, Effectively, we've got to get it from here uh, into this structure. Um, and this is what one of the files looks like. So this is the, uh, this is the posts one. So you have you define like this is going to be my ID column. Here's the properties I want to create. Uh, Michael, you remember Michael mentioned you can type things. So this is how you do it. For example, these are all ints. Um, exactly. And then that's what the posts file looks like. So it's quite similar as the CSV files we've been looking at before. Uh, this is the relationship. So it's kind of the same, just with slightly different titles. Yeah. Uh, and there's our script. This is what it took last time when we ran it in the morning. So this is the whole, this is how many is it? 30, 30 million 31, nodes, 30 million 70, nodes 70. 78 million relationships, 218 million properties. Um, let's see how we got on. So there we go. So we're done. Three minutes, eight seconds. I think we won. Yeah, we're faster. Um, the other cool thing you'll see uh, is that you get a file telling you uh, if there was anything that it couldn't create. Um, so you get like an input. So it's like, hey, these ones, I couldn't create a graph out of these. There was, you told me there was uh, going to be a relationship between these things, but I couldn't find one of the nodes. So you get kind of a report uh, of what, what well, effectively what might have been bad with the data that you, uh, that you provided it. Yep. Um, so quickly to wrap up. So in general, what I mentioned before, data quality is a big problem always. If you ever worked with external data, you know that data quality is always shit, right? So 
make sure that your data is in a, in a good shape to import it. Otherwise, you have to do round trips time and again. And these are some of the stuff that we found. Uh, Mark blocked about some of these. And uh, if you make sure that all of these are uh, custom for, for instance, by trying to use Cypher to look at your data, then all the other import things get, go much more smoothly after that. Um, in principle, import is always performance thing, so you can fast disk SSDs is preferred. Um, if you have separate disks for, for instance, streaming the CSVs into a, and writing to an SSD, compression, so both load CSV and the import tool can work with gzip files and also with uh, 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 deflated uh, HTTP requests and um, many cores. And the, the separation of the headers of the data is actually pretty cool because even if you can open a file, a 10 gigabyte file in VI to edit the header, <laughs> uh, it takes a while to open it and it takes a while to save it. And you can yeah. save that by just cutting off the header and then having a single line header file that's actually really super helpful. And that is the end. So if you want to grab the blog post uh, with the queries, it's sitting yeah. here. You, you have also have it. In uh, the, I have it. Yeah, I have it open in there as well. Uh, but otherwise, we have run on for way too long, so sorry about that, but thanks for coming. Yeah. Okay, cool.